From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. August 15th marked a critical anniversary. It is now over one year since the Taliban took over power in Afghanistan. With the fall of Kabul, the last bastion of the then government. After one year of the Taliban control, what does the progress report say? Can Afghanistan emerge from its new distinction? as a hunger hotspot stocked by famine and malnutrition. And how safe is it with the resurgence of terror attacks? Our guest today is not from the region, but has stayed on to serve the residents there. But first, a quick look at the past one year. When the Taliban returned to power last year, after two decades of U.S. occupation, they promised security. And after a suicide bomb attack at the Kabul airport in the early days of their return, which killed over 100 people, it seemed terror attacks had subsided. But after a year, there had been fresh explosions as well as a drone attack, killing a top leader of the outlawed al-Qaeda organization. The Taliban interim government is yet to be recognized by the international community and negotiations to recover the state's foreign currency reserves from the U.S. remain fruitless. There is a food and fuel crisis, jobs have been slashed, and the Afghan currency is falling. Donor assistance, once the backbone of the economy, has been withheld from the interim government. And if that's not bleak enough, there are concerns about women and girls, who face restrictions on education, employment, and even going out. I'm honored to be joined at this hour by Mary Ellen McGroarty, World Food Program's Country Director for Afghanistan. She's joining me from Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, Ma'am, I mean, first of all, I wish I had words to express my gratitude and admiration for your work. Um, We know that you took office in Kabul in October 2020, right? Yes, I, I joined the team here in October 2020. And then the next year, the U.S. Uh, troops withdraw and the Taliban government um, took over and they regrouped and then t- took over. Uh, we saw the images of chaos over there. We all remember that. Somehow, many people left and, and you decided to stay behind. Why did you decide to do that? I work for the United Nations and, you know, and, and the role of the United Nations and we really, and I and my colleagues that were here with me, you know, felt the people of Afghanistan needed the United Nations to stand by them at that those particularly difficult days and, and we didn't, we were not going to take down the blue flag of the UN in Afghanistan. Of course you have been through so much, what were some of the more memorable or touching moments that you have experienced in the past year? Those of us who were here on the 15th of August last year are, are reflecting back and, you know, what can, well, what that day, I suppose it went so quickly, but it, it was momentous in the change that it brought. I, I suppose what I remember from that day is, is probably the quietness, you know, of the take, you know what I mean, in that respect from what we were, you know, I mean, there was massive tra- traffic jams down in Kabul, but at the same time, there was very few shots fired and how that how it happened so quickly, I suppose. Um, Then over the last year, you know, as I've been out and about across Afghanistan, you know, people are adjusting to to a fragile piece, it's it's quite different, but they're also it's it's just the harsh economic reality, and and the humanitarian crisis now that that that's really that really grips you, and also the trauma that we're seeing in the people from from how things are going in Afghanistan. And then in the past year, how would you describe your working relationship with the new government that is the Taliban regime? Yeah, um, with the de facto authorities, you know, from the very beginning after after the 15th of August, because we already had a massive drought crisis in Afghanistan, you know, we were back uh, in operations on the 18th. Init- you know, we started talking to them as we need to do. I mean, everywhere we work as a World Food Programme, we, we talk to all sides so we can get humanitarian access. So over the year, you know, we've been working with them uh, to to resolve issues when we have local issues, when we have provincial issues. And overall, we've been able to reach 20, the 34 provinces, bringing food assistance to over 20 million people. 
I mean, were there challenges or uh, stumbling blocks, uh, you know, troubles, difficulties uh, when it comes to you and your organization working with the de facto authorities there? Yeah, I mean, there are. I mean, there, 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 you know, when you do come up against, I mean, it's far from perfect. They, you know, they want to be involved in how we define who gets assistance and how we select people. But I mean, that's done independently. Uh, you know, they want to be present at when we're delivering assistance, but that's also done independently. You know, I have found with, you know, in my dialogue with them and the dialogue with the teams with them, if we explain, you know, clearly why, you know, what explain. You, you know the purposes of the assistance were we're, we're able to make a breakthrough but what would you say was the most difficult part when it comes to one a change of government happening when you were there and two the very different government over there for me i suppose yeah it's a, it's, it's a different kind of an engagement um with the de facto authorities i mean it's it's very focused engagement because you're going just on very specific points I mean, I suppose over the last year, the thing that has been most difficult for me is, and, and you know, is the scale of the humanitarian crisis, but also the issues around women and girls have been particularly heartbreaking uh, and difficult. Oh, well, why did you say that? Well, I'm a woman myself. Huh? To think that at 12 years of age, you cannot go to school if you're a girl, right? Because the, 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 the schools for girls, adolescent girls remain closed. The fact that you're a woman that you that you cannot go to work or that you have to stay you know in your house and you can't go out unaccompanied it's very very difficult you know we still have our national female staff coming to work but in many sectors they're, they're not able to go to work and many of these women are the breadwinners for their houses for their household and you know you know after many decades of conflict afghanistan has a huge number of widows you know wid you know young widows old widows men who've been lost in the conflict they're the only breadwinner for their for their household and it's been it's very difficult for them so you're saying all this is happening despite the taliban's pledges that the girls and the women uh, would be fitted into the society yeah, yeah, I mean, we have, you know, month by month, different decrees are coming out, you know, about not being able to go out alone, having to have a mahram. The schools for girls remain, remain closed. Uh, let's talk about um, food, which is of ultimate importance <laughs> to people over there in Afghanistan, according to uh, latest mm -hmm. hunger hotspots reported by your organization, the World Food Program and the World Food and Agricultural Organization. In the past, three more countries faced immediate risk of starvation or death. Um, to start with, there was Ethiopia and then South Sudan and Yemen. Now, two more countries have been added to this list, unfortunately, Somalia and Afghanistan. Uh, what does it mean for Afghanistan to be added to the list? What did you see on the ground? It underscores the unprecedented levels of hunger that we're seeing in Afghanistan and the really at high risk levels that they're just on the brink of famine like conditions. In the latest assessment that we released um, back in, in May, in Gore province, you know, we had two districts that fell into what we call phase five you know, 20,000 people. And, you know, just underscoring that, that, that really the situation in Afghanistan is extremely fragile. People, households have exhausted all mechanisms that they have to be able to feed themselves. What it means Can you give us a sense people, of the hunger situation there out of the population in Afghanistan? Uh, how many of them are, you know, are hungry? 18.9 million people, Wong. That's almost 50% of the population. It's phenomenal. And, and 6 million of within that it are one step away from what we call famine-like conditions. That means, what that means practically is that on a daily basis, at least once a day, they cannot get an adequate meal to be able to feed themselves and their family. Let's talk about your work. Um, how, what are you doing to ensure that um, the food and necessities are delivered to those in need as soon as possible and as much as possible? Yeah, we, we have scaled up uh, over the last year. We have reached over 20 million people in 2022. We have over 2,000 distribution points across the country. We work with over 90 partners. Every single day, we have about 350 trucks moving across the country. We also provide cash to people. We provide vouchers. And as well as the emergency support, we're also focusing on programs that change lives. You know, we need to be able to 
to help households and communities to be able to fend for themselves. You know, we need to help the people of Afghanistan create a functioning economy, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in, in, in other businesses, so that the jobs can come back and that we reduce the humanitarian needs. But would you say your efforts, uh, you know, admirable as they are, are reactionary to what's happening on the ground. After all, it is their country, it is their de facto authorities, their government, um, you know, who are trying to rebuild or build institutions uh, that are taking care of their own people. We have a shared humanity, you know, I mean, and this is a, the spirit of, of humanitarianism, you know, I mean, and many of the people in Afghanistan are, find themselves in the situation today, not of their own making, you know, it's not of their own making. Decades and decades of conflict, uh, recurrent droughts, uh, the COVID crisis that had a terrible socioeconomic impact, and then the economic crisis, you know, the loss of jobs, you know, the economic footprint that went with the middle classes when they left, the economic footprint that went with the international community. You know, we have an obligation as a global community to assist. I mean, it's a lottery of birth at the end of the day. Can you give us some examples of the recent work or projects that you have been engaged in uh, that have made a difference? Yeah, I mean, we have some um, some very important projects going on at the moment because as we try to deliver, you know, try and deal with the hunger situation that people are facing today, we're trying to create solutions for the longer term. So we have a lot of projects around um, building canals and irrigation of land that we're doing, flood protection, which was quite useful in the recent floods. For women, we're doing a lot of particular work around vocational skills training to be able to give them some skills. And then one of the most exciting ones that we have is a project that you know, brings together local wheat, local soya, local dates and local ra raisins into a product for school meals. So we connect farmers and bakers and processors with our school meals program. And let's talk about the Ukraine crisis, a war that is happening over there uh, that has, of course, uh, impacted food and fuel prices. We've seen commodity prices rising, food prices rising. Uh, what is the impact of that on Afghanistan and on the work that you've been doing? Yeah, I mean, that's also, it's had a, a different different facets of impact, you know, all, on our supply chain because of that connection to Central Asia. So we we're experiencing delays, but most particularly on the cost, the operational costs, but also for the people of Afghanistan, you know, for our cash assistance that we deliver each month, we've had to increase that by 10% two months in a row because of mm. the inflation around food prices. Wheat flour, which is a main staple, has gone up by 30 percent. Vegetable oil has gone up by 40 percent. And you know, Wong, for people that spend over 80 percent of the small bit of income that they have on food, these price increases are devastating. Uh, indeed, uh, it will be hard yeah. for many residents of developed countries to imagine, but it is yes. happening um, for locals there. Um, I want to talk about, you know, the many crises facing us. For example, when Mariana Franco, head of the EU Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid, visited Afghanistan, she said, we need to keep the attention on Afghanistan. Um, you know, despite what's happening around the world, uh, there's, of course, this war in Ukraine and a crisis in Sri Lanka. But do you think uh, international global media uh, lens, uh, headlights and uh, attention have been turning away from Afghanistan. And do you fear that donors would switch their attention to these you know, countries with emerging crises? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's a worry. I, I was I was just home in Ireland recently for a, for a couple of weeks on leave, and and just hearing from that, you know, the, the 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 cost of living crisis that's impacting everywhere because of what's going on. And I, yeah, of course, I'm very concerned on the on the funding situation. But I, you know, my plea always is is to please, you know, in our, in our world of such wealth you know, our world of such wealth, we surely must have a, a, a enough to go around to help those that are much, much less fortunate than most of us. Yeah, we know that you have been going to remote areas in Afghanistan to provide food to men, women and children and eh. save lives. Eh. Uh, how are they surviving? I mean, uh, can you give us some you know, stories that you've encountered along the way? Uh, what was some of the more memorable ones? Yeah, I, I mean, I was be a couple of months ago, I actually got up to the Wahan Corridor, which is right up on the up in the north. 
I, I guess what struck me from there was even in that remote area, like that the economic crisis had an impact, COVID had an impact, you know, the, the decades of conflict and, you know, I mean, the drought. But what they were, what, what, what was really traumatic and to understand was also, you know, for the women, many of them who were teachers and all that couldn't, couldn't go to work, who were the heads of their own households, you know, it's, it's, it is amazing to go out and, and it's really much thanks to the, the generosity of our incredible donors and people to be thanking you for the assistance and, you know, yeah, that's, but at the end of the day, you know, you want to be able to give them something more that they don't need you. And that's what they were asking for. You know, they say, thank you for helping us through the winter, but now help us to have something more and sustaining that we're able, we're able to feed ourselves. I suppose that, you know, so we are doing some of those projects. And when you go to a farmer and you see, and he's telling you about now that you've helped him get, you know, to be able to irrigate his field and he's able to grow wheat and he's able to grow crops for his family. And I mean, that, that for me is, 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 it's what's memorable, but I think for this year and what I've seen over this year, I think what sticks with me is, is, is the trauma of, of just the crisis and, and, and the trauma of just, particularly for women and girls that's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, uh, are there local government systems, uh, bureaucracies set up yet uh, to work in concert with the World Food Program there? Yeah, I mean, you will find that the in a lot of the provinces and a lot of the districts and even at the capital level, like, I mean, a lot of the civil servants are still here. So so we do coordinate with them, you know, I mean, I mean, and what we do keep them all informed of what we're doing, discussing with them and how we're doing things. Yeah, you know, you've said something very arresting uh, in the middle of all these humanitarian crises, uh, food crisis, you said women and children in Afghanistan are disproportionately impacted. Uh, help us understand why is that yeah because of course i mean women of course feed their children first or they feed their husbands first you know i mean they always take it last you know the children get forgotten a little bit and of course you know i mean what we're seeing is women are are sacrificing really themselves to to feed their children but what we're finding with children is they're not getting enough nutritious food they're getting malnourished and you know once a child becomes malnourished that follows them for the rest of their life it follows them in their growth in their capacity and 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 this is why it's it's it, it's heartbreaking to see and, and and it really is a problem that we need to prevent uh, i mean also immunization is so important right for for babies for yeah. infants for young kids uh, yeah. they need to get immunized yeah. all the vaccine yeah. shots yeah. Uh, every every other week or so uh, as a father of two i can tell you all about it um <laughs> are you working you know closely with for example the who or other organizations in the region to make sure that um, the, the young babies, the infants, uh, the young kids there were properly immunized? Yeah, what we try to do is because we have such a platform of delivery as a World Food Program right across the country, what we try to do is use our platform of distributions for messaging and for follow up. And also because we're in the in the nutrition, in the nutrition centers and in the health centers. So there's a lot of collaboration around that on, on, on being able to get the messaging so that it supports the WHO and UNICEF programs around vaccinations. Right. Uh, you're working against a very difficult situation there. The hunger hotspots report said that while the overall <laughs> security situation had stabilized, attacks by non-state armed groups and intra-group fighting is expected to increase, actually. Uh, we did see violence recently, a resurgence of attacks here and there. How safe is it for the World Food Program team and for yourself uh, to work in uh, Kabul right now? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, you would be foolish not to be concerned, you know, I mean, you always have to be aware and diligent, you know, you saw the incidents, what, a couple of weeks ago in the last weeks and over, you, you know, in Kabul and it, and, you know, it's, it's a particularly important festival at the moment for, for, for Shia Muslims, so there's a lot of heightened attention around that. Um, so, yeah, we have seen an uptick or a deterioration a little bit in the security situation. We're still able to get out and about, but, but certainly it's with much more awareness and caution to be aware. And yeah. I mean, you talk about the difference uh, with the new de facto authorities there. Currently, there are 500 people uh, working for the WFP in Afghanistan, including women. And you said, uh, you know, uh, the content of their work is now very different. Uh, because there are rules regarding what they can do, uh, for example, only certain sectors 
uh, in which they're welcomed. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, we, we have managed to, you, you know, keep our national female staff at work. You know, food in the household is handled by the woman. You know, it is a woman that cooks. It is a woman that that looks after Usually, the children. Yeah. So we, yeah, we need. So we need. We need national Afghan women to be talking to Afghan women to help us understand what their needs are and how we can better design programs for them. So, for me, it's it, it is a priority that that we have those women working in our teams and in our partners' teams. So we, are, you know, we look at how how they are coming to work to make sure they have safe spaces given the current context that is very difficult for them. You know what I mean? So, it, it, yeah. you know, no country gets out of humanitarian needs or poverty without equal opportunity to education and work for both all its children and all its men and its women. You've been watching The Hub. More to come after a short break. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. Talking about equality, I've been talking to some officials recently from different countries. Um, some are facing war and uh, some are working on development challenges in their respective countries. Uh, they say that every time there is a crisis, uh, for example in Afghanistan or Iraq or Sri Lanka, uh, inequalities increase. Uh, is that what you saw in Afghanistan? Yes, of course, because what you're seeing is you're seeing people divest themselves of their assets to be able to survive. So, you know, like livestock, they reduce the number of livestock because they're selling off livestock to be able to eat. They're selling off household items to be able to eat. You know, they're going without something else. You know, they're either, you know, they're giving up if they had a course that they were attending, they give it up. They're giving up maybe health uh, access. Yeah, they're, they're making, you know, the very tough choices in order because their basic need of being able to eat is 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 not fulfilled right you know and we all know we need food to survive there's we cannot we cannot go many days without food before we before we come sick and, and this is and so that's what you see they they so when there is a crisis uh, those that have very little are forced to get rid of the very little that they have to be able to survive i mean tell us about the distribution system and the information system that you have over there I mean, what made you decide, for example, on a daily basis or weekly basis to distribute food um, to a certain region in Afghanistan? Is there a certain metric or algorithm there? Um, what kind of information system do you have in place? Uh, okay, we start with a very comprehensive food assessment. So we send teams right out across the country. So that brings all the data together, how people are coping, you know, their crops, their income, and we bring all that together. Then we're able to map out where, where in the country is most severely impacted. So we start at the provincial level. Then we use local inform information and informants at the district and break it down. To, we drill down to the community level. Uh, and then we do verifications once we have identified within the community. You know, so we work with com local community structures. We work with partners. Then we, to identify the individual households that are verified. Yeah, it's a massive task. I mean, we've over 90 partners. And then for every distribution, we have monitors. We have a help desk on the sites. You mean, we have over 700 monitors. We have what we call a, a feedback mechanism with telephone numbers. So we have a whole team of telephonists, so you can call them if you feel you should be included and give them your details. So it's, it's a massive network at the, at the moment, yeah. You know, when it comes to logistics, and supply of food. Um, is China involved in any ways? Are you working with the Chinese authorities or food providers uh, in any ways? 
Um, we have some, sm I mean, I, I know some of my recent fleet of trucks came from China, <laughs> so they did, the, the addition to, to they did, and I do, yeah, we do, we do discuss with, with, with your government in terms, in terms of support, um, in support to our operations here in Afghanistan. You know, when you look at the history of Afghanistan, um, some call it the quagmire of empires, uh, you've seen a long line of war and blood, and yet, people over there survived. How would you understand what's behind their, let's say, resilience? Oh, I, I don't, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, when I came in October 2020, I fell in love with the country. It's absolutely stunning, stunningly beautiful, but with that stunning beauty comes incredible hardship. They're on the first, the front lines of climate change. The people are absolutely amazing. You know, they're an incredible hospitality. But again, the extremes, the, the violence that we have all read about in the history books and everything else. I don't know, I guess the, the ruggedness maybe of Afghanistan, maybe the Afghan spirit. I mean, they're, they're a nation of incredible poets and writing and culture. And yeah, uh, you know, they're not a young nation. They're a nation of many centuries with great, incredible depth. And I think that's probably what comes to the fore. Uh. I mean, you decided to stay behind against the odds. And what is it that is, um, you know, keeping you going at this point? How long do you plan to stay there? <laughs> um, I suppose for us in Afghanistan, it's probably a two year or two or three year duty station. I suppose I come from a country, Ireland, that also knows poverty and And, and hunger, civil war, and, right? And yeah, and yeah exactly. You Think know, about what so, happened in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's a little bit of that that connection and I you know mean so um, and that's I suppose the people themselves keep me going you think every day that that we can do a little bit that makes it a little bit easier for them because I do I'm a firm a firm believer and we need to help each other you know it is only a lottery of birth you and I were probably lucky mm. of the time and place where we were born mm. uh, we didn't pick it we didn't choose it and I think for that because of the the luck the chances that we have had and I have had you know it, it, it's appropriate also to give back. Mary Ellen McCrory World Food Programs Country Director for Afghanistan kudos to your work all my respect and thank, thank you. you so much for joining thank us on the hub on CGTN. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all we have for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. Thank you for joining us. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.